super, super happy to have everyone with us tonight. Um, hopefully you'll have a, a great hour um, coming up, I'm sure of it. Um, so we've got Moss and Yolan here to, tonight to talk about the amazing chapter on myths um, and misconceptions of resilience. Um, I think we've got a, a wide range of uh, practitioners on tonight, from coaches to um, sports psychologists and to gen general people from um, kind of multidisciplinary backgrounds. Um, hopefully everyone can get something from tonight's session. And I'm going to pass over to Musan and Yolan in a minute to introduce themselves. I'm sure they don't need much of an introduction. Um, but before I do that, just to say... Um, if you do have any questions at all, please pop it in the chat. Um, me and Jen will be constantly monitoring the chat and there will be good, a good amount of time at the end um, for everyone for an opportunity to ask questions and for us to have a really nice discussion on the concept of resilience, kind of, you know, what is it? Um, can it be developed? Can, you know, any challenges, any thoughts? Nothing too difficult, <laughs> um, but I'm sure Moss and Yolan will be more than happy to, to answer any questions that you've got. So without further ado, I'll pass on to you guys. Um, I'll pop myself on mute, but like I said, if anyone's got any questions, pop it in the chat. Me and Jen will keep an eye out. And um, after about 30 minutes, we'll, we'll have a really nice discussion at the end. So enjoy the webinar tonight, guys. All right. Thanks. Well, first off, I, I want to say thanks to, to Amy and Jen for inviting us, um, not only to, to write this chapter on resilience and the myths around resilience, but also to invite us uh, to present here for you tonight. Um, thanks also for everybody here. Uh, it's nice to see that there's so many people who would like to spend their evening with us, so that, that's nice to see. Um, my name is Joran Kegelaars. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Vrije Universiteit Brussels in Belgium. And uh, yeah, with me together here is Mustafa Sarkar, um, Associate Professor of Sport and Exercise Psychology at Nottingham Trent University. And together we wrote this, this chapter on the myths and misconceptions around resilience. And we put here in between brackets in high performance sport because that's the context we're working in. That's the context we're starting from. Uh, that's probably the context that most of you are working in, but it's definitely not limited to that context. So a lot of the myths that we're gonna discuss also apply to resilience in, in broader uh, areas or broader domains. Just to kind of give you a, an idea or a background about what we are talking, if we're talking about resilience, probably most of you have, have seen this picture by now, uh, but it kind of illustrates quite nicely what resilience is all about. If we think about sports, then a lot of times people think about those exceptional high performances, but I probably don't have to tell you all that on the way leading up to those performances, there's a long pathway. And probably that's not going to be a smooth pathway. It's going to be quite rocky, quite um, littered with challenges, with setbacks, with stresses, with adversities. And it's about dealing with those adversities. That's very important in the fact whether or not athletes reach those high levels of performance. So when we talk about resilience, we're talking about how can we deal or overcome some of these challenges but at the same time, we're also thinking about how might we prepare for some of those challenges? So can we also work a little bit more proactively uh, to help athletes become stronger in dealing with some of the challenges that they might experience along the way? So if we would translate that into a, a quite simplistic, and, and this is definitely not an academic definition, but quite a simplistic definition, then with resilience, we're talking about the ability to withstand or recover quickly from adversities from stressors so that's what we're talking about now this idea of resilience it has grown quite a lot in popularity um, over the, the last couple of years and that's uh, both within the academic fields and i added a couple of publications here um, just to give you a little bit of an overview and, and uh, some sources for people who are interested in, in this research uh, this, for example, is a, a big systematic review that looked at some of the crucial psychological characteristics in youth athletes' development, and there they identified resilience as one of those important characteristics. This is another review that looked more at factors that are predicting or, or um, leading to success at the highest senior professional level, 
again, they identified us as resilience, uh, resilience as one of those important factors. And this is a quite recent paper, more of a, an applied sports psychological model that again focused on developing resilience as one of the key pillars of, of their program. But we also see that resilience started to get more popular in, let's say, the, the popular science literature. And this is, again, just one example, very interesting book by Mark Williams, looking at the different factors that contribute to elite athlete success. And again, he talks in quite, to quite length to this idea of resilience, and this, this ability to deal with some of the, sec, uh, the setbacks along the, the athletic development pathway. And then finally, resilience has also become more and more a, somewhat of a buzzword within, let's say, the popular media. And if you go online, it won't be difficult to find all these different kinds of articles looking at how can we develop resilience or what are the key characteristics of resilient people. And in a way, that's, it's nice. It's nice to see the, the importance of, of um, resilience being recognized. But at the same time, uh, I think both Moose, Moose and I, uh, as resilience researchers, kind of felt that a lot of times when resilience is discussed, especially in popular media or in the applied field, there might still be some, some misconceptions, um, some ideas that are not really aligned with our academic or scientific understanding of resilience. So that's why we were very happy that, that we got to, to write this, this chapter um, where we tried to look at what are some of those common myth, myths and, and misconceptions around resilience uh, in sports and, and how might be a, or what might be a better way to look at those. And within the chapter, we highlight around seven common misconceptions. I say seven-ish because uh, several of those myths kind of built upon each other and are related to each other. Today, I won't have time to go through them all. Um, I will discuss three of what we believe are some of the, the biggest, most important myths uh, around resilience, but also some of the myths that might have the most uh, problematic implications when it comes to applied work. Uh, and then after I discuss those three, I'll give the floor to Mus and, and he'll discuss a little bit more of those, those practical implications. What does it mean to consider resilience in a different way? So a first um, very big myth or misunderstanding around resilience that we see in the literature, in the applied field, in the popular media, is that resilience relates to a stable personality trait or at least a constellation of traits. So several personal traits considered together. And actually this misunderstanding or this myth has its origins within the scientific literature. If we look back at uh, the 60s, 70s, 80s, when the construct of resilience was first introduced, a lot of researchers thought or believed that it was indeed a trait. It was a stable characteristic that some unique individuals seem to possess and others not. And that could explain why these unique individuals were better able to deal with some of the stressors. But as the years progressed, we more and more start seeing that resilience, as we see it, doesn't really align with that idea of a stable personality trait. And that's for a number of reasons. First off, we start to see that the ability to demonstrate resilience actually is contextual. So that means if we see one person being able to demonstrate resilience at one point in time around one stressor, that does not necessarily, necessarily mean that that same individual will be able to demonstrate resilience in relation to a different stressor or a different area of their life. So that ability does not really necessarily translate all the time between different contexts or different stressors. We also see that resilience is temporarily dynamic, which is a fancy way to say that it seems to fluctuate over time. If we take that same individual who demonstrated resilience at one point in time, if you look at another point in time, it's not necessarily the case that that same individual will again demonstrate resilience in relation to a similar stressor. There might be changes there. And finally, we see that resilience can actually be changed. It can actually be developed over time as well. And actually that was the topic of my PhD uh, where I tried to look at what is the role of the coach in fostering resilience? What can they do um, in their day-to-day -day interactions with athletes to develop this, this ability to demonstrate 
resilience. So each of these three, that, that contextual nature, that, that fluctuation over time, the changeability of resilience kind of suggests that it's not a stable personality traits. There's something else going on. And right now within the literature, we most of the time see resilience as a dynamic process. So it's a phenomenon that happens over time. It's not stable, but it's something that occurs in relation to a specific adversity. And there is something that the athletes is able to do together with their environment uh, in order to adapt to that specific stressor. So it's a process rather than a stable personality trait. A second myth, kind of building upon that first myth, is the idea that resilience is mainly something internal, something individual, that there are internal capacities that make some athletes being able to deal with adversities better than others. In reality, um, we see that resilience oftentimes is the result of some sort of a, of a balance, a balance between, on the one hand, these internal factors. And we just said resilience is not a personality trait, but there seem to be certain personality factors that can contribute to resilience. Likewise, there seems to be other internal psychological factors, psychological states, psychological skills that seem to contribute to resilience. And these are just some examples. This is not necessarily an exhaustive list, but just some examples are optimism or an optimistic attribution style in response to certain adversities. The quality of motivation of athletes. Athletes can be an important factor in, in promoting resilience. The confidence, the self-efficacy that athletes have um, in their own capacity to deal with that situation. Challenge appraisals, building on the work around challenge state, threat states seem to be quite important as well. The ability of the athletes to see that specific stressor as a challenge, an opportunity for growth rather than just a threat, just a, a negative experience. And self-reflection or metacognitive skills also seem to be a factor, an internal factor contributing to resilience. The ability to reflect back on your experiences, think about, okay, what happened? What were my emotional, uh, cognitive, behavioral responses? How did it help me? What can I do better to deal with adversities in the future? These internal factors all seem to contribute. But at the same time, there are also a number of more external, situational, situational environmental factors that also seem to contribute to resilience. And here we see, for example, that social support is one of the, if not the most consistent factor that's being related to resilience, not only in sport, but across domains. So the support perceived and received by the close environment seems to be a very, very important factor when it comes to resilience. In relation to that, we also see that, for example, the coach-athlete the coach relationship can be quite important in fostering resilience. The motivational climate that is created by the coach or by the staff might also be quite important. So more autonomy, supportive climates as well can promote resilience. The balance that an athlete has between sport and other domains of their life might also be a factor that can contribute to resilience. So having other meaningful interests, activities outside of sport. For example, a dual career combining sport with an educational pathway. And finally, past experiences might also be a situational factor that kind of contributes to resilience. We have quite strong, robust data to suggest that quite extreme, adverse, potentially traumatic experiences um, are a negative factor or are negatively associated with resilience. So these potentially traumatic experiences can uh, diminish athletes' capacity to demonstrate resilience. But at the same time, we also see that having very little or no uh, past adverse experiences can also be a negative uh, factor for resilience. So it seems to be that having some moderate adverse experiences might actually be um, the best situation to develop your resilience future. So again, it's a situational factor that leads to resilience within the athlete. So um, why is this important? Because it also raises the question, and, and Musu will discuss this a little bit later on in a little bit more detail. Um, 
how can we promote resilience? Are we focusing on the individual? Are we looking more at the environment? Yeah. If the individual has all the skills, but the environment doesn't help him or her um, to deal with those negative situations, are we supporting the athlete in the best way that we can? And then a third important uh, resilience myth is the idea that resilience is related to a lack of emotions and especially a lack of strong negative emotions. And this myth is, is kind of related to the idea of resilience as, as toughness, as, as pushing through, as, as not showing how or if an adversity affects you. Okay? Whereas actually already in some of the earliest uh, research on resilience in sport, um, some of our colleagues, Kelly and Vili, actually found uh, and they looked at the whole process of resilience and the different factors that were at, at play in that process. And they found that central within that process were some of these unpleasant and unpleasant emotions, some of these negative emotions. They saw that the athletes start questioning themselves, like, why am I doing this? Why am I pursuing the goals that I'm pursuing? It, it created certain mental struggles. But it were those emotions and those mental struggles that actually seemed to be the catalyst for on the one hand, the positive adaptation to the stressor that they were experiencing at the time, but also in the development of certain resources, certain skills that they could use later on and strengthen their resilience to future adversities and stressors. So resilience is not about a lack of emotions. Resilience is also not about what we might call toxic positivity, positivity the idea that you just tell your athlete like, hey, think positive, be positive, and everything will be fine. No, resilience is about being aware of your emotional responses, recognizing where they're coming from, accepting them, and then seeing how can we adapt in the best way possible in this situation to get to a better outcome. So that's what resilience is about in relation to those emotional responses. So these were just three of, of some of the, the major myths that we discussed in the chapter. So resilience as a trait, resilience as as uh, solely individual and resilience as the lack of negative emotions. I'll now pass the floor to Mus and he'll discuss some of the, the more practical implications of those myths. Thanks, Yelan. Um, so I think um, just building on, on, on what Yelan mentioned, with resilience being a buzzword, um, kind of really highlight the importance for coaches and practitioners, making sure that there is real clarity around what resilience is, but equally importantly, what resilience is not. And that's a question that I often ask coaches is, in your, in your environment, in your context, in your team, in your organization, if you're asking athletes to demonstrate resilience, what, what exactly, what specifically are you expecting? What behaviors, what skills, what capacities are you kind of expecting in that environment to ensure that there's real clarity around terminology? In a real, real practical sense, whenever I describe resilience, um, we talk about it as the ability to maintain functioning when under pressure. Um, in the academic literature, there's a, there's a little bit of debate about is resilience about just being able to maintain functioning it? Is it about enhanced levels of functioning? Um, or is actually being able to recover levels of functioning. So there is debates around that. Um, and when we're talking about functioning, we've also that's also got to be very context specific. So is functioning about performance? Ultimately, in a sport context, when we're talking about functioning, we're, pr we're probably going to be talking about performance and well-being. So the ability to maintain performance and well-being when under pressure. Again, in the academic literature, there's debates about is resilience about pressure more broadly or is it specifically around um, negative events or uh, adversities again what, that's one of the myths that we talk about kind of in the chapter but broadly speaking we're talking about the ability to maintain performance and well-being when under pressure and just building on um, building on some of the the myths that Yolan mentioned um, these are kind of, I guess, five, five areas that I often talk about when I talk about clarity around this kind of terminology. The first myth um, Yolan's already talked about, I guess just one thing I wanted to highlight is, again, language. I often hear 
coaches, practitioners talking about individuals or labeling individuals as either resilient or not resilient. And I'm really, really hesitant when someone is labeled as resilient because it suggests that it's a quality that you either have or you don't have. And similar to what Yolan mentioned, if we're talking about resilience as context specific and time dependent, and we're then using the word or labeling someone as a resilient person, we're then suggesting that actually resilience is static and, it, and it's fixed. So I think we've got to be really careful with language and terminology around labeling someone as a resilient person or a resilient individual. Um, I prefer to talking about someone as either having higher or lower levels of resilience, depending on context and depending on time. The second area, um, again, is this idea that Yola mentioned about uh, resilience being a capacity that needs to be intentionally developed, trained and practiced. Often people will say to me, Muslim, isn't resilience just about experience? And I kind of mentioned that, yeah, experience plays a role, but we need to be able to do something with that experience for it to then result in some sort of, uh, you know, for it to contribute to our subsequent levels of resilience. Learning and, and self-reflection needs to be part of that particular process. So resilience is not automatically de developed through experience, for example. It needs to be intentionally taught uh, and developed. The, the third area, um, this is actually a quote directly from the Harvard Business Review article. If you just type in resilience is about how you recharge, not how you endure, that Harvard Business Review article should, uh, should appear. Um, again, there is this myth to suggest that resilience is about working harder, working longer. In the context of endurance and sport, um, you know, resilience is about uh, playing through pain, playing through injury, uh, which again is, is completely far from the truth. Uh, we know, and, and the research is, is starting to develop, although it's a little bit um, in its infancy, the link between rest and recovery and resilience. So if, you, if we want individuals to be able to maintain their functioning when they're under pressure, they not only need to be able to switch on, but they also need to be able to switch off. And I think that requires a, a, a shift in language and, and, and a notion that Resilience is not just about working harder, working longer, giving, and not giving up, but it's about incorporating rest and recovery throughout, throughout that process. The fourth um, area, again, Jonas talked about resilience not being an individual, or not being solely an individual quality. Um, resilience being relational, so related to our social support, but also resilience being related to the environment. And again, I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in, a, in a real practical sense in, in a little while. And then, um, and then lastly, yeah, Yo Yolan's mentioned this around resilience not being about the absence or suppression of emotion, but actually taking the time to become aware of our thoughts and our emotions. And that, that awareness is, is actually what resilience is about rather than the absence or suppression. So I just wanted to, building on, on some of those myths that Yolan's talked about and that we've just built upon right now, I just wanted to give a few Sport specific, um, sport kind of illustrations to, to highlight um, the importance of terminology and language. Some of you might be familiar with the, uh, the White Review. Uh, for those of you who are not, the, the White Review was an independent investigation um, commissioned by Sport England and UK Sport following allegations of, of maltreatment and abuse. Uh, within the sport of British gymnastics. The White Review is a very, very detailed review. It's a 300-page review. What was really interesting was that the culture to develop resilience, and I'm purposely putting resilience in quotation marks because you'll see in a minute in terms of how resilience was being described, the culture to develop resilience actually contributed to maltreatment and abuse in the sport. And when you see where coaches were describing resilience, it's not a surprise that if coaches are describing resilience in that way, it's going to lead to some really negative and dangerous consequences. So this is a quote that's come directly from the White Report that is recently as 2020, only two or three years ago, coaches 
on the performance pathway, the coach curriculum materials were referring to resilience as the ability to suffer. So in my mind, if we're describing or coaches are describing resilience as the ability to suffer, it's not a surprise that we're then being in a situation where um, there are allegations and, 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 and founded incidences, reports, and the culture of maltreatment and abuse in the sport. And Anne White in her report goes on to say that this use of language does little to move the culture on. I would actually go one step further than that to say, actually, I don't think it's just, it does little to move the culture on. Actually, this use of language is actually highly problematic and very, very dangerous. So often kind of coaches will say, well, what, you know, why, why do you get so bogged down and picky when it comes to definitions? Why do you have to go, go into the academic literature around it? And for me, this is a perfect example of that. If we're not describing resilience accurately, scientifically, um, and we're basing it on anecdotal or basing it on, on, on conversation or popular press, we're then in a real, real difficult, um, dangerous situation where behaviours then can be potentially um, talked about and, and linked with this kind of terminology. We, we, we'd be really great. I can see a few questions already uh, coming up in the, in the chat. We will kind of address those. There'll be at least, at least 20 minutes or so for some questions and discussions. And it'd be great to hear what, what people think around some of the language uh, in, in terms of resilience. The, the last area I just wanted to briefly kind of touch upon was the idea of the role of the environment playing a crucial role in terms of the development of resilience. And it links back to, to what Yolan said here previously about resilience, often the myth of resilience being linked to purely an individual quality. And often what that means is that the responsibility to develop resilience lies predominantly on the individual. And that's where resilience has become a bit of a dirty word. This is actually a, a, a commentary article from David Oliver, who's a consultant in the National Health Service, the, the NHS in the UK. Um, and he talks about this in the context of doctors and nurses, but I think this translates also to the context of, of sport. And in this commentary article, he highlights that absor abs absorbing negative conditions makes resilience a dirty word. It shifts the blame and responsibility for doctors and nurses' struggles away from what he argues, uh, the NHS being over-politicized, understaffed, underfunded, and badly organized as a system. And it shifts that blame from the system onto the individual. And he, he argues that actually the so-called kind of drive to develop resilience is actually, depending on how it's framed, can actually be victim blaming. You're blaming, doc, in this case, doctors and nurses for not being resilient enough, while at the same time not thinking about the system, the environment, the culture that is being created within that. So I think we've got to be really careful in terms of how we're using the term resilience. If we're talking about, you know, I, I often have this point that resilience workshops, resilience webinars can be very, very beneficial. But often when we put on a resilience workshop for an athlete, uh, for a coach, for a practitioner, we're putting on the emphasis on the individual to do something about their resilience. We don't often have conversations with, with you know, senior leadership about what they can do around the environment to actually either facilitate someone's resilience or then potentially to undermine someone's resilience. And again, there's a lot of really interesting research in healthcare. Uh, this is a, a really nice article around resilience and surgeons, uh, the debate around do you train the individual or do you change the system? Again, I'll give you my views, uh, but it'd be really good to have, you know, hear some comments in the chat and uh, open those up for, for discussion and conversation. My view is that I guess, and this is ba based on evidence, that I think if we train the individual based on some of those internal factors that Yolan talked about earlier on, you're like, it's likely to be easier, not easy, but certainly easier, but it's likely to lead to short to medium term changes. Whereas if you change the system, 
it's going to be a lot more difficult, likely to take months, if in some cases, possibly years, but it's more likely to lead to sustained change over a period of time. So in my view, actually, it's a combination of the two. It's not me kind of sitting on the fence. You're trying to train the individual while at the same time trying to change the system, recognizing the fact that changing the system is going to be a lot more slow. So you're training the individual in the short to medium term with the overall intention of actually changing the system um, in the kind of the positive direction. Just my views, but yeah, happy to take, really good to hear people's thoughts around where does the responsibility lie when it comes to resilience development? So we, we wanted to make sure that actually there was enough time for, for, for questions and then discussion and conversations. So we're just gonna leave it there, just in terms of a couple of, of references and reading. Um, on, the, on the bottom, you can see obviously the actual reference to the uh, chapter in the Myths of Sports Coaching book. Um, but I also wanted to highlight that the chapter, um, uh, the, the first reference, uh, this is a, a little bit more of an academic reference, but particularly around looking at some of the similarities and differences with related terminology. Often in psychology, we get, um, and I think rightly so, uh, we get kind of accused of maybe using um, the same term where we're actually, or, or using different terminology for actually meaning exactly the same thing. That's what we mean by this jangle fallacy. You know, describing, uh, using different terminology for describing, essentially describing the same thing. And in this chapter, um, in the book, Growth Following Adversity in Sport, we start to unpick some of the conceptual similarities and differences between the terms growth, resilience, and thriving. Uh, for those of you who are interested in some of that more kind of conceptual terminology uh, related um, reading and referencing. Um, but we'll leave it there. Uh, please feel free to reach out to Yolan and I um, either via email um, or via social media. Um, but we'll open it up now for, for questions and discussion. Thanks so much. Um, Mustafa and Yulan, we're back in the room. There's a few questions that have come in there. I don't know, Yulan, if you've seen them while Mustafa was working his way uh, through the end of the brilliant presentation. There's so much there and I don't want to be selfish. I have questions that I'm uh, burning away to ask you from my own environment and what I've seen over the years, but I'll hold for a minute. Um, Jeff has got a question here. We'll start with that. We, we haven't previously asked people to unmute or uh, turn their camera on and off because of bandwidth, but could you build resilience by taking people out of their comfort zone and challenge them to work and think differently? Yeah, I, 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 I can take this one. Um, it's, it's a really interesting one. And it's, it's one that actually a large chunk of my PhD was, was revolved around. Um, what we found that is that indeed coaches used certain what we call plan disruptions. So they created small disruptions, challenges, you might say, to push them out of their comfort zone. Only we have to be very careful in how they are set up. Because on the one hand, we see that plan disruptions, um, this type of stress inoculation can be one of the most powerful techniques to let athletes build resilience, teach them how to deal with adversities, but it might also have the potential to be misused. And that's where we get into the territory that was described with, with the white paper. Um, so it, it's, it's as much about how do you set up those interventions? What are the skills that you offer beforehand to make sure that your athletes are capable to deal with those challenges? Um, how do you reflect on them back uh, afterwards, after those planned disruptions? Uh, how do you create buy-in within your, within your athletes to set up these kind of interventions? So these are all important considerations if you want to do this kind of intervention. So short answer, yes, but it's quite complex. Moss, is there anything that you'd like to add or will we move to another question? Yeah, no, happy to, to move on. Again, yeah, uh, some of you will be familiar with our kind of uh, uh, our framework in terms of kind of challenge and support. Um, so, um, very similar to what Yona mentioned is that, yeah, the, the challenge in itself or the plan disruption is only really part of the story, um, but it needs to be provided with, with support alongside that. Um, that that's what I would, have, I would have added on really. 
Brilliant. Thanks so much. Um, John, is there therefore is is therefore resilience a behavior rather than a characteristic, a learned behavior, he says? Any thoughts on that? I can take that initially, Yola, and then please do build on it. Um, I think resilience, how I would probably describe resilience is actually as a capacity, uh, a capacity or a kind of a capability. And that is learned, definitely. There is, def there is some evidence to suggest that there is a genetic or an, an innate component to resilience. So we're not at all suggesting that, you know, genetics, personality don't play a role. Uh, but certainly resilience is a skill or a capacity that can be developed, trained and practiced. And there are certain behaviours that um, are associated with that. Uh, but yeah, that would be my, my kind of take on it. I don't know, Yelena, if you wanted uh, to add. Yeah, I, I was just going to add it, it. There are definitely certain behavioural aspects that can contribute to resilience, but resilience is more than the behavioural part. It's also, for example, the cognitions. And, and then that builds to the work we mentioned around challenge and threat state, challenge appraisals. Like, How do you perceive the situation that you're in might be a step before the behavior that also already contributes to resilience? Are you viewing it as, as a situation that can offer you something that, that can help you develop? Or are you viewing it as just a negative, just a, a threat? Um, so it's, it's more than only the, the behavioral part, I would say. Thanks so much. Um, Tristan also makes a great comment in the chat. I'll leave us to read that and, and ponder over it. Um, Anika says, do you believe in a concept called too much resilience or resilience fatigue? I'd really like to know your thoughts on this. And could that be a myth? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's a really interesting one. And, and actually, I think that's it's an area where research now will start to look at and, and start coming out. Um, like what's what's too much resilience i don't know if there's too much resilience but i think that certain capacities or certain factors that contribute to resilience might in certain situations be too much uh, and i might just look at, at at motivation and and things like grid there is some research to suggest that that grid might be somewhat related to resilience but i can imagine that there are situations where you have too much grid you keep pursuing the same efforts, even though things are, are going badly. And it might be a much more healthy approach to take a step back and to reflect and to see uh, how can I do things differently. So there are definitely factors that contribute to resilience that might um, start working inversely or, or become hindering at, at a certain point. Yeah, it's a, re it's a really good question. I've just um, put into the chat um, an article from the Harvard Business Review that talks about the dark side of resilience. Um, and again, linking in this, to this idea of it, it, you know, is too much resilience a bad thing? And I think the, the, the one area where I think is when, and again, this links into the myth about endurance. And I think there is a difference between, for example, resilience and perseverance. Um, that sometimes actually the better course of action is rather than constantly going at the same thing without giving up, is sometimes actually giving up and actually taking a slightly different course of action. And we know that there is a link between resilience and flexibility, for example. Uh, flexibility is a really important part of resilience development. So rather than being just kind of so determined that you're just gonna keep going down this one path, being flexible and taking a slightly different type of direction is, becomes then really, really important. Um, but whereas if we go with that notion of, of resilience just being about pushing through, um, then actually too much of that is certainly a bad thing for sure. Um, so yeah, just wanted to kind of build on that. Jen, do you mind if we take, I know we kind of um, yeah. looked at Tristan's comment in the chat. I, I wanted to adjust that one. Is that all right? Absolutely. I was just giving you time to, to work your way through it, but absolutely. And he's also come back with um, a kind of a tail end of that in, in with is resilience in an elite sport environment subjective of coaches don't understand the definition which i know you touched on language um so yeah happy, happy absolutely go yeah yeah again it would be good to get your views on this as well but my view my view is that it has it, and it can be used uh Kristen asked you know is it a term uh where coaches seeking a winning at all costs approach can hide behind and, and i think the 
it's not not all people will do that, but it, it can, has the potential. Resilience has that terminology and potential where we're doing this, or coaches can argue we're doing this in the name of resilience development. So I think we've got to be really careful that it, it's, it's not used in that way. Um, and yes, as Tristan mentioned in the quote, there is anecdotally gold medalists do have to endure and you know to get to you know, they have to go through different adversities to get to where they are, but that doesn't that doesn't excuse really really unacceptable coaching practices in the name of, of resilience because actually that's not what resilience is about um going back to this idea that yes challenge plays a role but actually that the support alongside that becomes really important otherwise it actually has the completely opposite consequences that you want where people are going to be um their, their well-being is going to be detrimentally affected uh, people are going to burn out people are going to be dropping out of the sport um, and yeah, the, the second part of that question, um, it can be subjective for sure. And that's why I think as a really important starting exercise for teams and organizations, you know, what is your, as a team and as an organization, what is your definition of resilience? Making sure that it's got to be practical. I'm not necessarily suggesting that a team going to delve into the academic literature, but it needs to be scientifically grounded and evidence-based, but practical in a way that res resonates with your culture and resonates with you know, your, your context. Um, but that, that starting point about what it is, what it's not, what behaviors are you expecting for someone to show that they're demonstrating resilience, I think becomes then important where then people can't say it's not subjective. Everyone then becomes on the same wavelength everyone is then singing off the same hymn sheet uh, from right from the start. Um, I don't know, Yolan, if you've got any additional thoughts in relation to that. Yeah, I, I, was, I was thinking, um, but probably I'm, I'm going too much uh, down the academic route, that it, it's almost like a, a philosophical question. It, it asks the question about the epistem epistemology uh, around resilience. And, and on the one hand, there is a phenomenon of resilience that we can, we can measure, we can assess, we can look at, we, we can make it more or less objective but at the same time it's also it's almost like a heuristic it's it's part of the language so people are using it and and probably that use it is a little bit subjective and and might be a little bit more or less aligned with with the objective phenomenon that we see and that we try to study so yes and no yes the the meaning of resilience can be quite subjective to the coach and at the same time, it is it is a phenomenon that we can observe. So I, th I guess that's also why we write a chapter like this is try to create that meaning so that people have a, a little bit of a better understanding um, of the scientific term rather than just a colloquial term. And I think just just on that, Yolan started by saying resilience has been a bit of a buzzword. And the, the danger of resilience being a buzzword is that the word resilience is starting to be lost in translation a little bit. But at the same time, I've heard people say, you know, resilience is not, you know, it's just a fictitious term or it's a buzzword. It doesn't really mean anything. But actually, there is a lot of, even before sport, in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, resilience has got a very, very well-grounded scientific literature in developmental psychology, social psychology. So we, we can't hide behind the fact that our resilience is a buzzword it doesn't it doesn't mean anything there is yes we need to ensure clarity yes we need to make sure that we are conceptually very very rigorous and conceptually very very tight but resilience is not just a word that's just been come about it has got a very very good grounding in in psychology um, in the 80s and 90s um, so I, I just thought i'd mention that in terms of that Amazing. Um, and I don't know, you obviously can pick out questions as we go along as well, but I'm just working my way down and I think you're answering some parts of those questions of other people as we go through. Lorraine at the top um, of the list said, to find out a level of resilience um, of, uh, find out their level of resilience a team has, do all the members have to be, for example, interviewed? Because if only one um, individual or one or two were interviewed, then I've got kind of a, a partial team resilience view. What are your thoughts there? Moose, do you want to take this or? I, I can take you. You take it initially, then I can build on that. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, what, what we didn't address in the presentation, but we touched upon a, a little bit in the chapter is there is a, a different line of research that looks at team resilience. Um, so there's the individual resilience and then what do you do as a team? And a lot of the research shows that, yes, it's about the resilience of the individuals, but much more than that, it's about collective processes. So when we discuss team resilience, I would be much more looking at some of those collective processes rather than looking at what's the resilience of every single individual within my team. I think that's a bigger part of the solution to that question. Yeah, and ultimately, I think when it comes to team resilience, what we're finding is that this is not, this is not to say this is not important for individual resilience, but at the team level, it seems like relationships are playing a very, very crucial role. Um, so some of the collective processes that Yolan mentioned, things like you know, shared leadership, having a really strong social identity, uh, distinctive social identity, those seem to play a really important role around team resilience. And, and also we, we've started, as well as the line of research around team resilience, uh, there's been a little bit of research also now broadening it out to, to organizational resilience, so resilience in, in an organizational uh, setting. And again, that has different uh, characteristics and processes that are involved in that as well. Thank you so much. Um, Manisha says, are there differences um, from the literature and, re and research you've done yourself, the differences between how different cultures view resilience, especially when looking at individual and team? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a really, really good question. And in all honesty, especially in sports, but in resilience research in general, as in a lot of different other fields, there is too much focus on a wide Western perspective on resilience. And at least I'm not aware of, of a lot of really strong literature that either way suggests that there are similarities or differences between our Westernized culture and, and other cultures. So in all fairness, I, I, I don't have a clear answer for you. No, I was going to say very similar to Yolanda. that, yeah, we don't know enough about um, culture, certainly in a sporting context. There is one author who's done a lot of stuff in kind of general or mainstream psychology. I've just put his name into the chat. Um, a guy, a professor called Michael Unger, uh, who's done some really, really nice work around resilience across cultures. It's not sports specific, um, but I definitely think that's a, that's a really, really big, big avenue for future research um, that we, we need to understand similarities and differences um, in terms of how, how culture plays a role, for sure. Shannon brought to our attention something, that, as you've mentioned, around language already. With regards to language and terminology, is mental toughness interchangeable with resilience? And I know even from our own environment, there's other um, words that come under the umbrella and people just find that safety net and just bringing them all to the front. Um, uh, Yolan, you've mentioned a few already. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very good question, a very common question as well. And I guess there's also is something where people's interpretation might differ a little bit. Um, for me, looking at the literature on mental toughness, it mostly seems to present mental toughness as more of a trait. So mental toughness is more something that people seem to have that helps them to deal with certain challenging situations, also helps them to persevere in maybe less challenging situation for example also just the repetitiveness of of practicing like the sometimes boring nature of of sports like mental toughness can can help you push through that but it's it's mainly an internal quality whereas resilience is is more that process it's resilience only happens when there is an adversity mental toughness is, is a quality that you can have always resilience happens within the context of a certain adversity or stressor so for me, that's the distinction. There is somewhat of a relationship in, in the sense that there is literature to suggest that that personal quality of mental toughness can also help in demonstrating resilience. So there's some intersection, but resilience is much more the process than, than mental toughness. And just linking... Um well finding a link here go into I think it's Juna or Yuna's um, comment and question have you conducted research or come across in the literature um, on specific sports and boxing and martial arts as mentioned 
Um, and then the tail end of that, which you can address, obviously, anyone you want. And to have you observed or noted if there's a relationship between mindfulness and meditation and building resilience. So I don't know if you want to draw on the first one. Have you conducted research on a specific sport such as boxing, martial arts and the tail end of that, um, the observation around the relationship? I can I can already add in relation to the second point, yeah. um, not necessarily in sports, but a lot of the literature um, more in, in psychology more broadly has suggested that mindfulness might be one of those interventions that could be quite effective in, in developing resilience. Um, some some reviews, some meta analysis um, really showed mindfulness. And I also saw um, a comment on, on CBT, cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. yeah, those those seem to be two of the, the major, more therapeutic approaches uh, to, to develop resilience. Yeah, Just, we, we, did a, we did a systematic review of all of the resilience training interventions in the workplace. Um, and yeah, mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, there is also, um, I'm just trying to find it here at the moment, but um, there is also a kind of a self, a kind of a, a acceptance commitment therapy and ACT approach. Um, specifically in relation to you know self uh, kind of a self-compassion um kind of a lens to also re resilience development so i guess what we found in our review and i think this is really important is when it comes to resilience development there isn't one set way um there are many many different ways that resilience can be developed and again that's where you understanding your context understanding your population becomes really important as part of that Brilliant. So the tail end of Denise's question, and then one more, if that's OK, um, where she does mention CBT, but also then talks about independently of coaches. So we like in the in different environments, the interventions or do they require support from the coaches? Is there anything there that we can explore? I, I think for me, it, it, it comes back. It comes back to one of the points that, that Moose made is that are you focusing on, on the individual and, and CBT mindfulness might be very effective um, interventions at the individual level. And I wouldn't necessarily expect coaches to take up any CBT like role if they're not trained for that. But coaches might still be very important in creating that supportive environment. So not making it only the intervention focus at the individual, but also looking at how can the environment be more supportive and, and what's the role of the coach in, in doing that. So I think they would complement each other rather than the coach needing to take an active role in the CBT. Thank you so much. Now we are pressed for time, but I think Lisa's question that we're going to bring to the table here might be something that needs another hour or two to go into, um, along with the other valuable questions we've had tonight and the material. Lisa asks, could it be that if an athlete's experienced trauma in their life, if a nurturing environment, <clears throat> if a nurturing environment is created with a supportive coaching team, perhaps that athlete can draw from the past trauma slash experience as a positive um, to help them overcome challenges with the right support. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, uh, really good, good question. Um, it comes back to um, a, a lot of the debates that are going on in, in sports. To put it really um, straightforward, yes, it can. There is some research, and, and George Bonanno is, is a, a big name in this area, um, looking at the impact of traumatic events, traumatic life events. And he demonstrated that for most people, and you have to be very careful, with this, most people seem to come out of those traumatic events at least okay, as in not developing uh, PTSD. However, we should be really careful to then say, ah, but if they come out okay, that means that they became stronger and actually trauma might not be a bad thing. Of course, we want to avoid trauma anywhere we can. And in relation to developing the new skills, yes, trauma can develop skills that, that help you in demonstrating resilience in the future. But we also see that the more traumatic, the more severe the adversity is someone faced, the more difficult that becomes. 
So having slightly, moderately, but not traumatic experiences might actually be much more helpful in, in drawing those, um, those new skills out than, than the real traumatic events. So yes, potentially it might be, but we have to be very careful in that. Thank you so much. Amy, you're in, are you? Yeah, thanks, Jen. And thanks, guys. Um, really nice kind of way to finish there. Um, really nice point there, y'all. And just a really quick one from me, just to finish it off. If we've got coaches, practitioners on tonight and they're really thinking, right, how can I help the people that I coach and work with develop resilience? Where would be a good kind of resource? Obviously, apart from the book, um, apart from reading the the chapter what would you recommend as a good go-to resource or resources well if we're talking about the academic literature then i'll, oh, yeah. I'll do some self-promotion and say my phd um yeah. if, if any coaches are interested um they can they can find a google scholar or if they don't have access they can find me on on researchgate Mm -hmm. just requests access to the publications and I can freely share them. Thank you. Again, probably on the, on the self-promotion side a little bit as well, but um, we, yeah, very recently, actually, uh, last year, um, in, in, in the journal called Sports Psychology in Action, so it's a very, very practical journal, uh, also not very long, so it's only 10 pages, I think, in total, but it's specifically around developing not only individual resilience, but also team resilience. So that, that's a good starting point in terms of it's evidence-based, but also very, very practical in nature. Uh, happy to put a, li a link for that into, into the chat. That's amazing. Thank you so much again, both. Um, are you happy for people to get in touch with you um, for emails or Twitter or social media if they've got any follow-up questions? Yeah. yeah. Right. And thanks most for putting, for keeping on top of the chat and putting all them resources in there. Um, I, I saw there was a question, and again, I haven't spoken to Yolan about it, but um, in terms of the slides, Yolan, we're okay, aren't we, in terms of to, yeah. to share the share slides, them. so we'll, we'll send it across to you, maybe Amy and Jen in a, in a PDF, um, and then that P I'm ha happy for that PDF to be sent out. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, thanks again. Just one thing from me, um, just a little bit of promotion um, for our program at LGMU. Um, can you see that, Jen Moss, Yolan? No, just, I can see the screens. Let me, are you sharing a screen? Yeah. Mm, nothing yet, Aim. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'm just sharing, well, I was just promoting our program at LGMU. Uh, um, applica applications are open for our Masters in Sports Coaching if anyone is interested um please contact Colin Cronin um it's a blended online program uh, which is kind of 80% online um and 20% on campus so I, I promised uh LGMU and Dr Colin Cronin that I'd promote um the course uh, and I'll follow up with everyone after this um after we finish tonight so thanks again Yolan and Mustafa just to remind everyone, our next webinar is on the 26th of April. And um, look out on Twitter for advertisement on that, which will be hopefully within the next week. So we'll call it a night there. It's one minute past eight. So um, I'm sure everyone wants to sign up and enjoy the rest of their evening.